Let's pray. Father, we sing just now of your love for us, of knowing it. And the line of logic there is knowing that you love us, we trust you. Father, would you teach us what we just sang and said we know? Would you press into us the wonder of what was just prayed that we are your people. We are not our sins and our failures, but we are yours because of your love for us. We know that. We declare it. We pray it. We say amen to it. We sing it. So please, Lord, would you more deeply persuade us of that? Help us to know what we know. Use the wonder of that then to move us to faith. Faith today and tomorrow and the next day. Believing that we are yours and that you will meet us tomorrow and the next day with even more of your gracious favor. Lord, would you use the passage that's before us today to show us another piece of that, another angle of it of all the good that you are for us and the various ways that you've loved us. Show us another piece of that today. Cause us to see and and to be thankful for your great love for us and then move us to faithful following. You are remarkably, remarkably, continually gracious and good. Show us that. Teach it to us again. Make the passage clear. And Lord, if there are various distractions here in our, in our midst, be they if sinful distractions or just physical, material distractions, Lord, would you remove them? Would you focus our minds? Would you give us grace even now to, to repent of sin and turn from it? And, and just grab our attention, Lord, in whatever way is necessary to, to help us to, to see you in this passage. And move us then with what you show us. Thank you, God, for your your great goodness, for your grace to us. Spirit of God, would you have your way here in this room now with us to illumine the scriptures and to apply them to our hearts in, in countless ways, to build up your church and to honor the name of the Son. It's our request, so please do that this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Build it, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to the middle of Luke chapter 8. Having dealt so far with some teaching from Jesus in the first half of the chapter, we've now transitioned to the second half looking at a collection of Jesus' actions, all of which are, are shown to us here. Luke's put them here to reveal to us more of who Jesus is, and why we should trust him. Verses 22 to 25, Luke recounted for us, what we read there, the the story of Jesus' calming of this sudden storm. On the initiative of Jesus, something that, as we talked about, always happens, it's always in the initiative of Jesus, but it's recounted here so that we would see it, wouldn't miss it. On the initiative of Jesus, they end up in this boat on the lake at this time. He's the one who said, let's get into the boat and go over. So it's his fault that they are there in this moment, vulnerable when this windstorm hits and the waves begin to swamp the boat. They are in great danger. The disciples are panicked, in fact. But Jesus, the perfect son, is at rest amidst the storm, depicted for us, shown to us in the fact that he's sleeping. We're we're shown that three times. He's asleep. He's sleeping. He is sleeping. Well, around him, everybody else is panicking. He's, he is modeling the man at rest in God's hand. Well, everybody else around him is panicked in fear. And then he's awakened, of course, and he shows his great authority over the storm. He commands it to cease, and it all stops suddenly, instantly, amazingly, remarkably, shockingly. It's hard to imagine. Raging storm, nothing. 
Jesus is this man who is asleep and is modeling perfect dependence on God, and then he awakes and shows that he is the Lord of Psalm 107, who, in the words of that psalm, stills the storm. So at the end of the passage, the question raised on the disciples' lips is supposed to be what we're asking ourselves. Who is this then? Having seen that, who is this? He's a man. He's the perfect son. And he's the Lord Almighty. He is this God. He's the sovereign one who reigns and shows us what trust look like, looks like and invites us to trust him. It's the previous passage. He reigns over nature, over powers that can't be seen and that affect us that we can't do anything about. And he leads us into those things and then through them sometimes to show us more of who he is and to draw out from us faith, trust. Remind us that this is the one who's with us. He's in the boat, so to speak. Not, not in the same dilemma with us, but with us all through life. He's Lord over nature. And this morning then, Luke moves us on to show us Lord over evil. Moves us into a different realm. Shows us something of Jesus as he meets and deals with this demon-possessed man. It's a long passage. I'm going to read the whole passage, verse, beginning in verse 26, and we'll work back through it, making three observations, the last one of which is very short. Jesus is Lord over nature, and now Lord over evil. Beginning in verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. And the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Luke chapter 8. First observation, then dealing with the identity of Jesus. Here it is. Jesus has authority over the supernatural, the demonic spirit world. Jesus has authority over the supernatural, the demonic spirit world. The problem in this passage is obviously the supernatural nature. The boat lands in this region, which is on the east side, if you're looking at a map, on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, opposite the land of Galilee. And this is Gentile land. Geographically, we know that, plus the presence of all the pigs, hints at it, as a few other notes do. He's come ashore in this Gentile land, and as soon as he comes ashore, he is met by this man that, verse 27, we are told, 
who had demons. Sometimes in the passage, the situation is presented as it would have appeared, and it's just called demon in the singular, when the demon possesses the man and it's a, it's a one person talking, one voice talking, it's presented in the singular, verse 29, the unclean spirit, the demon. But at other times we get the plural, demons. And in fact, that's the point of the question that Jesus asks in verse 30. When he asks, what is your name? The demon says, legion, for many demons had entered him. In English, we, we use that word, legion, and we use it in the way that captures the meaning of many. We might say something like, the causes of the increase are legion. And we mean many causes. Causes are legion. So we, we have that idea in English, but we're, when we use that, we're missing a little bit of the context from this passage. Because the word legion, the legion in that day, in that context, would have said military. The legion is a basic Roman military unit, thousands of men. So if I were to say to you today something like, what is your name, regiment? What is your name, brigade? What is your name, division? You would hear military, army, lots of guys. Many soldiers. That's what this demon says. What is your name? We are a legion a demonic army, if you will. A demonic military unit has captured this man. And here at the shore, Jesus has landed and the military unit from the demonic pit of hell has met him and we're expecting a fight, a supernatural battle between Jesus and a demonic army. Except that it isn't a battle in any sense at all. I'm not, I don't watch a lot of horror movies. Never, in fact. But I've seen the clips, and every time a horror movie has an exorcism scene, it, there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of shrieking and a lot of screaming and a lot of sweating and a lot of writhing. This would be a terrible movie scene. Because there's no battle here whatsoever. None. None. We're expecting it. The demonic legion comes to meet its enemy at the shore, face down, on hands and knees, begging. Verse 28, when he, the demon, possessing and using this man's body, in the singular, he saw Jesus and cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, begging, please don't torment me. Not much of a fight. It's a submission from the very beginning. Because the demons know the one they are dealing with. This is, in their words, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. They have that right. He is the unique Son. And they use a generic term here, not a Hebrew or Jewish or biblical term. They use a Gentile generic, Most High God. This Jesus is the Son that is the anointed representative, the anointed ruler from the high God, from the God. Come now. And they ask him, what have you to do with me? Meaning, please have nothing to do with me. I don't want you around here. Please don't torment me. Don't torment us. It's begging, it's asking, it's submissive. And what the demons ask is also interesting. Because of what it says about the situation, about what they recognize is the relationship here, Jesus and them. Please don't torment me. A request that's expanded then by the continued begging in verse 31. It's all the same conversation. Please don't cast us into the abyss. Please don't cast us into the place of the dead where all of the judged dead will go at the day of judgment forever and ever to be tormented. That's our destiny. Don't throw us there yet. Please don't begin the tormenting now. They recognize, Jesus, you could torment us. And one day will. 
And maybe you've come to do that right now. I hope not. I'm asking not. I'm begging that not right now. Though it would be within your right and it would be within the right and certainly within your power to do so, please don't. He sits in authority over, not just power over. They recognize something here. We might use, we might use the, the language of begging, of asking for something in a temporary situation where we recognize I'm cornered in an alley and you're strong. Please don't hurt me. But here's a situation, not in a moment of desperation, not in a moment of, of you've got me at, for a time, you've got a leg up on me, but here's a, a recognition of what is right and what will be. You, Jesus, are the ruler, are the Lord, are the authority over us, and you will torment us in the abyss eventually. Please, not yet. That tells us of the relationship between Jesus and evil. We do not live in a world that is dualistic, that is a dark and and light struggle, that is a good and evil struggle, that sometimes one, sometimes the other seems to have sway. We don't live in that kind of a world. We live in this kind of a world. And all the forces of darkness recognize it and know that their time is short, that the judgment is pending. And every moment that evil exists is is on permission. Please, begging. And he grants permission. It is a one up, one down world. And Jesus has all authority. All authority. And he grants them permission to go into the pigs, and they do. This section is, that's what this section is contributing to the flow of this chapter. We have Jesus in authority over nature, over natural things. And what's coming up is Jesus in authority over illness and death. And here in the middle, we have darkness and evil. Jesus is Lord over that too. which does leave some of us a little bit puzzled because never minding what I was just saying about we don't live in a dualistic world, it's, it's a one-up, one-down world, a whole bunch of us are, are really to our core rationalists and we don't believe that there's a spirit world. Yeah, there's evil stuff done by people, but, uh, and officially, officially, yes, there are demons. But we Westerners don't really think like this. I had, I had a teacher one time who said, who put it like this, it stuck with me. He said, you don't really believe this, but the universe is alive. And putting it like that, I thought, yeah, you know, I think, we tend to think, this is what is. I can see you, I I can interact with you, you're alive, I'm alive, we're alive. We don't realize the universe is alive. That's for people in animistic tribal cultures to believe. They're onto something true. We don't think that they are. We've come too far in our maturity. The world is full of spirits. It is alive. And if you were to stop and consider that for a moment, it should freak you out. Because you can't see any of them. Not one. And they hate you. Many powers that hate you and you can't see them. What kind of danger are you in? 
vast. Vast. You walk around all day long thinking that everything's great. I should change my tone, I suppose. That, that sounds insulting to you. I don't mean to be insulting to you, but we, we walk around all day long as if everything's great. No idea that lurking in the world are numerous, powerful spirits who hate you that you can't see. The universe is alive and it is not your friend. All of the powers work for the one who has come to kill, steal, and destroy you. That's a problem. That's a problem. And many cultures of the world are, are very much more in touch with that. But even in America, there are people who are in touch with that. The same, the same teacher said, if, if you walk into some of the backroom parlors in New Orleans, which I have not done, so do you find stuff there that you find, you discover your rationalism because you start trying to explain away, you start trying to look under the, under the table. How do you do that? What's, what's, what's the trick? What's the trick? We assume it's a trick. And sometimes it is. But sometimes it isn't. We don't believe that. But it's true. Sometimes it isn't a trick. And sometimes it's not just kept in, the, in the, some back parlor in New Orleans. Sometimes it's, it's right on the streets of Salt Lake. How many people, it's impossible to say, how many people that we find contained in mental hospitals diagnosed with XYZ are actually like this guy demonically possessed how many not all but not none we've seen this before in luke right remember how i said this like a hundred times in that one sermon not all but not none not all but not none not all but not none this man would be diagnosed and institutionalized if we could catch him if we had the government funding etc 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 but fundamentally, his problem is not biological, it's not chemical, it's demonic. So maybe you have actually met a demon-possessed person. I don't know. The point is, all of that is real. The universe is alive. And Jesus reigns over it. And everything that happens in it, everything that it, that it executes in the earth is on the basis of begging and permission granted. We can't say why or how Jesus determines to grant this permission or that. Why did he send them into pigs? Who knows? But they had to beg and he had to say okay for it to happen. Jesus has absolute authority over the supernatural, over the demonic, over the spirit world. We need to move further into this and, and connect it to our lives more tightly, which takes us to the second point. This great authority is for something. If you follow the train of thought in the, in the second point here. The first point is just a statement of fact. He is in authority over it. He does reign over it. But the second point, we, we've got to kind of say, and, or so what? This great authority is for something, particularly for this, for the delivering of his people from evil. This is where this is supposed to come home to us here, to you. It is for something, for the delivering of his people from evil. This authority, it just is, but if it's not purposeful, it's, it, it can be irrelevant or, or not really worth thinking about if it just is out there somewhere. But it's not. Look at this passage again. There's something interesting here. 
Is the lordship of Jesus over evil prominent in the passage? Of course. Of course. Sure. Just said that. But it's not the only thing in this passage. And I would actually suggest that at different points in the passage, it's not even the main thing in the passage. Look, for instance, verse 29 Right after the demon speaks, begging Jesus not to torment him, we get this curious statement, verse 29, it's a flashback. For he, Jesus, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It just strikes you as a little odd. Because what it says is that Luke didn't bother to tell us about that. He's flashing back. For, this has happened, I forgot to tell you about the part when he actually cast the demon out. He didn't narrate that, just tells us that it had already happened. Something's interesting there, something of a, of a, a slight de-emphasis that particularly comes out when we compare this to chapter 4, the other passage so far in the Gospel of Luke that shows Jesus casting out a demon. You look at chapter 4, Jesus healed a man there with a solitary demon, and we read chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Be silent and come out of him. There we have the actual casting out. There we have the words of be silent and come out of him. There, but here, nothing of that sort. We just get a flashback. Curiously absent. Not that it's not clear that that happened, but it's not mainly emphasized. And what's more, what is emphasized back in chapter 4, we get nothing about the man. Not a thing. Nothing about his life before, nothing about his life after. Here, we get both extensively. Verses 27 and 29, we get this man's before life, and we have a clear picture painted for us. This man's life is, is one that is destroyed, that is terrible, that's full of isolation, that's a disaster. And then, in the words of verse 36, the demon-possessed man was healed, and we get a rather detailed picture of that, too. We get some of the back in his right mind, what that looks like, what he wants, how he acts. In all, there is much more in this passage about the healing of the man, particularly compared to chapter 4, there's more of the picture of the man than there really is even of what it was like to cast out the demon. This passage comes down on a different foot. Not that there's nothing about the demon, but it's a different emphasis. We are shown this man and we are drawn to him and, and we identify with this guy, this Gentile man, a man enslaved by sin but sought out deliberately, providentially sought out by Jesus. Why does this event even happen? So back in verse 22, Jesus got into a boat. Let us go over to the other side. Why? You'll see. Let's go sailing. He comes, he lands, as he steps out on the land, verse 27, there met him, what a coincidence, a man who had demons. What a coincidence. Now we've seen in the passage, he lived among the dead. He lived in the tombs. He was often chained up so that he couldn't get away. And then sometimes the demons, not all the time, but many a time, it seized him, it says, and would break the bonds and drag him out in the desert. But at this moment, right now, at this particular time, he's neither chained up somewhere else, nor living among the tombs, nor chased out in the desert. He has regained some control of himself and happens to be at the shore, right at the spot where Jesus lands after being delayed by that storm. Not because the man wants to be there. The man has no idea Jesus is coming, and certainly not because the demons want to be there. Why does this happen? Because Jesus wants him to be there. Jesus went sailing to deliver 
a Gentile man from evil. Jesus sought him out, came across the sea with this authority for the purpose of setting this man free. It didn't just happen. It's on purpose. How does that matter to us? I mean, it's a nice thing for that guy. Good for him. Bring this, in, bring this into this life. Bring it here to, to, to today. Think about yourself. Apart from the possession of people and, and this, the extreme kind of demonic oppression of particular individuals, which happens, but admittedly we don't see as much of, apart from that, the Bible exhorts us all to remember that our struggle here right now is not against flesh and blood, against the people that we can see. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, the powers behind them, the ones we can't see. There is a struggle and there is an enemy, and he prowls on the earth like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And he is influencing all the thoughts and in all the circumstances, he's steering all of the world, orchestrating a, a great evil, a great dark assault in the world that we face, that you face all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. Sometimes you are keenly aware. I was talking to somebody this week who was just recounting thing after thing after thing after thing. Maybe, maybe it's not like this. Maybe it's like this. Thing after thing after thing after thing after thing. What's behind all of that? Well, certainly people are involved. Certainly our own sinful flesh is involved. But behind that is an enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy you. At work, always, 24-7, relentlessly, secretly. Hidden oftentimes from view because like any good guerrilla enemy, he knows it's wise to remain undercover. It's more effective that way. The attack is more likely to succeed. We have a real enemy that Jesus is in authority over. And Jesus is not just abstractly in authority over, but he is in authority over that enemy for the sake of delivering you, his people, from that power, from that destruction. And he will seek you out in the circumstance in which you are to save you. Now that may not be always to eliminate it but it will be to save you from what its design is, your death and destruction, to save you from it. So you face a great enemy. How much danger are you in? A lot. Except that you're not. Because Jesus is in authority, and Jesus is with you. But I think there's something more that we need to consider here, because of what all this is pointing at, really. Up to this point, I'm talking about this unseen world that is pressing in and seeking our destruction, and that's real. Don't forget that. But there's, there's more that this passage is really about. When it shows him Lord over evil, something else we should think about as we look again at this man and see what actually happened to him. We're shown this man's story. What happened? What has God done for him? What is he supposed to declare about that? Well, you look at him. The man was, was delivered from this demonic oppression, and he became just like all the other non-demon oppressed men in town, right? No. No. He's not possessed by a demon, demons, set free, and then left just like everybody else. This man's different. 
They come and they find him in his right mind, clothed at the feet of Jesus in the the position of learning, the position of submitted learning, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And when Jesus leaves, he begs to be with him. Not not even just to go with him, but to be with him. He's a he's what's born here is not just a demon free man, but a one who is submitted, who is a learner, and who wants to be a follower of Jesus. And then when that's denied him on, on a, for deliberate purpose, what's happened? He becomes one who proclaims. The word there is the word for preaching. The one who stays and preaches all that God has done for him in Jesus. What's born here? What this man has turned into is not just someone freed from a, de- from a demonic possession, but what's born here is a follower and a proclaimer of Jesus. Jesus sought him out, not just to set him free from demonic oppression, but to set him free from evil. And this is our greatest need. Our greatest need is not some sort of of shield, some protection from the demonic powers that are out there that hate us, but our greatest human need from birth is to be set free from a different enslavement. Our real problem is that all of us by nature grow up captives of evil, in bondage to evil, enslaved by evil in a different more devastating way. We are born in bondage to sin and we are blind to the depth of it. We don't see it and we are unable to do anything about it. How great of a danger were you in? Vast. And all of the world has no clue to it. The world is unable to see it, but in the words of Ephesians 2, we all grow up living dead dead in trespasses and sins and following blindly, following the course of this world and following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. Romans 3 describes us, all of humankind, no one righteous, all are wicked, no one understands the truth, all are deceived. That's who we are. Unbeknownst to us from birth, evil binds us, enslaves us within, not just out there somewhere, but within. And we are unable to see it and unable to break free from it. And whenever we get some sense of it, whenever we get some sense of some sort of a, of a thing that needs to be fixed or made right with me, the world's response, and this is so, it sounds so religious, but it is so common and so wrong. The world's response is, in some way or another, work better to shape up. Something's wrong in here. You're, you're, you're broken. You're, you're in some way bent, in some way turned towards evil. Well, what you need to do is do better at not doing that. It sounds so right. It's so natural to us. But it's lunacy. We're told about this this bondage through this story because it should be crystal clear to us that this man right here could do nothing to deliver himself. Nothing at all. The deliverance of God from evil is a sovereign work that he travels across the ocean to seek out and to save the one who was unaware of and could do nothing about his dilemma. That's the model of what it's like for God to set us free from the bondage, from the death in here. We, we were totally unaware of it and could do nothing about. And when we saw some little glimpse of it, we tried, but we're, we're bound to fail. Jesus comes with all authority to set us free from the bondage in our hearts to darkness, to, to cast out of us the unclean spirit and to bring us to a true and real deliverance. This is what his power is for. Think about this, Christian. He does not just want to set you free from something. He wants to set you free to something, to cast out the unclean spirit and to put in the clean spirit, to bring you from a life of death and bondage and evil to a life of life and light and righteousness and goodness This is what God 
does on purpose, deliberately seeking you out to save you and make you different and new. Modeled for us in how Jesus totally 180 changed this man's life. That's what he does for us. To put aside evil. To break us free from evil within and to make us clean and new and whole within. This is what he has done for you to make you a people dependent on him, to bring you to his feet, to make you a learner and a follower and a proclaimer of him. So let me just put it let me just put it in front of you. This is sort of the third observation. Uh, okay, uh, uh, here's the third observation. Once truly seen, the delivering authority of Jesus reshapes or threatens. Once truly seen, truly seen, the delivering of authority, the delivering authority of Jesus reshapes or threatens. If you see it, it pushes you one way or the other. So Christian, what I want to put in front of you is, do you see it? This man, it should be crystal clear from the story, this man did not come to sit at the feet of Jesus, ask to be a follower of his, and go about proclaiming him in order to be delivered from evil. It should be crystal clear the other way around. And the only reason he responds as he did with this reshaped, reformed new life is because he has seen something of Jesus for him. Come across the sea for him. To set him free. And he's experienced that and, and sits in front of it Mouth open, amazed. I could say, do say, will say, so proclaim that in the body and to each other to help one another see that. Preach this to each other and to yourself. Could say that, and that would be good to do, Important to do. But I also want to maybe turn that just a tad and, and ask you, do, do you see it? Do you take the time to sit and see it. All of it. So the, the act of Jesus' seeking you out to deliver you, the delivering, the, the cross, we celebrate today with wine and, and bread, the cross, and then do you see the new life? Pastor Jed prayed earlier something you should write down and put on your mirror, dashboard or whatever. I forget it exactly what you said, Jed, but we are not our sins, we are not our failings, we are not, we are, I forget the wording, sons or heirs or children. He sought you out. He saved you at the cross, not just from evil, to a new existence. Do you see that? Not do you believe it. 
Do you see it and live in it? And, and moment by moment, walk in life as, yep, that's a mess in my life right there, but that's not me. I did that. So it is me in some sense, but it's not who I am. Because Jesus sought me out deliberately, me, sought me out and saved me at the cross, took out the evil, unclean spirit and put in me a new spirit, I am, you are, new. Different. No longer under condemnation and no longer bound to live this life of futility. Now that new spirit moves you to follow his decrees and there is still indeed struggle against the darkness that's all around us. I'm not saying this man certainly didn't experience a deliverance from all trouble. The people in town did not like Jesus. They probably weren't going to love him. But he's a new man in that town. Because of something that day by day he can't get away from. The last word of the passage, go and tell them how much God has done for you. The last word in the passage in the actual language is Jesus. So he went about proclaiming how much had been done for him in Jesus. This man gets up every morning going about Jesus. Because he saw not just that Jesus, you know, some month ago, two months ago, three months ago, sought me out, came across in the boat, landed, delivered me from evil, but he made me new. And that's who you are. Do you see that? Part of the way you see that is by proclaiming it to each other and proclaiming it to yourself. Indeed, do that, but do you see it? It is, Christian, it is the foundation for walking in newness of life to see that you are new. That the old is gone and the new has come and that by the initiative of Jesus who has all authority and power to deliver you from that old, to deliver you from evil. To take off of you not just condemnation but to take off of you, to cut away from you the flesh and to set you free. So I got to say something about the other guys. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this last part next week. But everybody else is threatened by all this because they really clearly see power that's not under my control. And they don't want anything to do with it. They are seized with great fear. They were afraid. We're told that twice. Why? Well, certainly they're seeing something that's unsettling, all the demonic activity, but they, they knew that guy. They'd seen that demonic activity before. What's unsettling about this? Well, here's a power above that that casts that out. There's a story, I'll spare you all the details of the story, but about a, a woman who was a witch who, a long time ago, came to Christ, and one of the first pieces of her, her conversion was the realization that she was among a people that had some clean power on them. I can tell you more about the details later if you want to, but I'm short on time. She detected some clean power a power like she knew, but different than like she knew. And in some way, by grace, God drew her. But there's something in us, maybe in you, that detects a clean power, and you're driven from it. And you should ask yourself, why? Why would you be driven from this Jesus? Why would you be threatened by this Jesus? who casts out what is destructive and brings in what is life. Why would you be threatened by this Jesus? Why don't you want anything to do with this Jesus? 
Maybe that should alert you to something's not right in me if I'm put off by this good one. Be alert to that condition of your heart. And I encourage you, come and check him out again. Come back. There is a power here that is a clean power, that is a good power that would set you free. It would bring you from darkness to light and give you life. Don't be threatened by this. Be wooed by it. This is the Jesus who has all authority and power to set us free from evil. He can do that for you. And Christian, he has done that for you. By his initiative and by his power, you have been set free and made new and you are different. So walk with him. Let me pray. Lord, we don't know all of the moment-by-moment movings of the spirit world all around us, but you do. As we read our Bibles and, and see this story and think about what it points to, we revel in the fact that you have come, sought us out, made us yours, delivered us from evil, And so we are secure and safe. Thank you. Thank you for being a power that is for us. Thank you for setting us free from sin. And I pray for your people here today that you would would show us, that you would remind us that by your initiative and power you have made us different and new cause to well up in us a a reshaped, a renewed heart. And from that, then a life. A life of thankful praise. Lord, you are good and you are, are very kind. Show us some more of that even now as we move towards communion and take the cup and the bread in our hands. Would you show us some more of your kindness and some more of your grace. Thank you, Lord. Amen.